All right, let me tell you how it all started. I was in a car accident a few weeks back. It was pretty bad. Totaled my car and left me stuck in bed for a month. While I'm lying there trying to recover, things with Emily started to feel off. At first, it was small stuff. She'd be on the phone constantly, always stepping out of the room to take calls. And every time she'd come back, she'd have this forced smile on her face, like she was trying way too hard to act normal. I didn't think much of it at first, figured she was just stressed out from all the extra stuff she had to handle while I was down. Then one day, I saw her leaving Tom's apartment. Yeah, Tom, the guy who caused the accident. It didn't hit me right away, but when I saw her hugging him goodbye and kissing him on the cheek, I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. That was when everything clicked. I knew Tom was Emily's ex, but I never thought they'd be anything more than friendly. But watching them together like that, I knew it was more than just friendly. I was stuck in bed, feeling helpless, and here she was, being so obvious about it. It wasn't just the sight of them together that bothered me. It was everything leading up to it. How Emily would come home late, or how she'd hide her phone whenever I walked into the room. She was trying so hard to cover it up, but the signs were all there. So from that moment, I knew I had to find out more. I was angry, hurt, and honestly I felt betrayed. All I could think about was how I was going to deal with this once I got back on my feet. So after I saw Emily with Tom, things started getting really tense. I was stuck in bed, but my mind was racing. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously wrong. Emily's behavior was becoming more suspicious every day. I started paying closer attention to her routines. She'd get these late-night calls, and whenever I asked who it was, she'd just say it was work or some friend from a book club, but it was always the same, vague and never really adding up. And then there were the texts. I'd catch glimpses of her phone while she was texting, and the messages were definitely not friendly. They had a tone that was way too intimate for my comfort. One evening, I noticed Emily leaving the house dressed up more than usual. She said she was going out with some friends, but it was strange because she'd been saying how exhausted she was from all the extra work at home. I couldn't shake the feeling that she was lying. I mean, who gets all dressed up for a casual night out with friends? I tried to ignore it, but then I found a receipt in her purse. It was for a fancy restaurant, one I'd never heard of. The total was pretty high and it didn't match any of the plans Emily had told me about. I asked her about it, and she said it was for a surprise dinner she'd planned for me. But honestly, it didn't make sense. Why would she keep it a secret, especially with everything that was going on? I was getting more and more frustrated. I felt like I was piecing together a puzzle, but I was missing a lot of pieces. Every time I tried to bring it up with Emily, she'd get defensive and change the subject. It was clear she was hiding something, and the more I tried to find out, the more she seemed to pull away. Okay, so things were really starting to heat up. I'd been stewing over my suspicions, and it was driving me nuts. I knew I needed solid proof, so I decided to dig a little deeper. It wasn't easy, especially being stuck in bed, but I managed to gather enough evidence to confirm my worst fears. One day while Emily was out, I went through her purse again. I know it's not the best thing to do, but I needed to know. I found a small gift bag tucked away at the bottom. Inside was a fancy necklace with a note that read, For my favorite person, love Tom. Seeing that note was like a gut punch. There was no denying it now. Emily was having an affair with Tom. But that wasn't all. I found more receipts for fancy dinners. Some from places I knew Emily wouldn't go alone. There were also several handwritten notes that Emily had apparently kept hidden. They were full of affectionate messages and inside jokes clearly between her and Tom. Each one seemed to confirm that their relationship was far more than just a fling. And then, there were the texts. I managed to access her phone one night while she was in the shower. I saw a string of messages between Emily and Tom. They were talking about their plans, their feelings for each other, and even references to past intimate moments. It was all right there, clear as day. I felt sick looking at it, but I knew I couldn't ignore it anymore. The betrayal was in my face. Emily was cheating on me with Tom, and it was happening right under my nose. I decided it was time to confront her, but I wanted to make sure I had everything I needed. I didn't want her to wiggle out of this one. 
So I started planning how I would confront Emily with this proof. I wanted her to see that I knew everything and that there was no more room for lies. I was done being kept in the dark and treated like a fool. All right, so now I had all the proof I needed. I felt like I was finally ready to confront Emily and make her face the music. I thought it would be a simple conversation, but boy was I wrong. I waited for the perfect moment. One evening, when I knew she'd be home from her so-called friend's night out, I gathered all the evidence. The text messages, the receipts, the notes, and the necklace. I laid everything out in front of me, ready to show her what I had uncovered. When Emily walked in, I could tell right away that something was off. She was trying to act normal, but I could see the tension in her face. I didn't waste any time. I started by asking her straight up about the gift bag and the necklace. She looked at me, confused at first, and then the realization seemed to hit her. Her response was classic. She tried to play it cool, saying the necklace was a mistake and that she'd meant to return it. When I pushed her about the receipts and texts, she started getting defensive. She claimed the dinners were just business dinners and that the texts were from a group chat with friends, not Tom. The more I pressed her, the more elaborate her excuses became. She said Tom was just an old friend she'd reconnected with and that the affectionate messages were taken out of context. She even tried to twist it around, saying that, I must be imagining things or misinterpreting the evidence. The confrontation turned into a shouting match. Emily accused me of not trusting her and being paranoid. She said I was overreacting and that I had no right to invade her privacy. It was maddening. Every time I tried to show her the proof, she'd deflect or deny it, making excuses that didn't hold up. But I wasn't buying it. I knew what I had seen and read and it was clear that Emily was lying through her teeth. The more she denied it, the more resolved I became to make her face the truth. I had to show her that no matter how many lies she spun, I wasn't going to let her get away with this. The argument ended with her storming out, leaving me alone with my anger and the bitter realization that Emily was not only cheating, but also playing me for a fool. After that heated confrontation, I was more determined than ever to get my revenge. I wasn't just going to let Emily walk away from this without facing some serious consequences. I knew I had to make her pay for the betrayal, and I wanted to do it in a way that would leave a lasting impact. First, I needed to figure out exactly how to execute my plan. I wasn't just thinking about a few petty acts. I wanted to hit her where it hurt, and I wanted everyone to know. I started with the basics how to make the biggest splash and ensure that Emily and Tom would be exposed in the most humiliating way possible. One of the things I knew I wanted to do was sabotage the condoms. It might seem petty, but I figured it would send a clear message that I wasn't going to just sit back and let things slide. I got my hands on a few packs of condoms, punctured them, and then carefully placed them back where Emily kept them. It was a small act, but it was meant to add a layer of discomfort to their already messed up situation. Next on my list was Emily's car. I knew I wanted to make a big scene, so I planned to wrap her car in plastic wrap and tape it up so that it was completely immobilized. I wanted it to be impossible for her to ignore and to make sure everyone could see the mess. I figured it'd be a public spectacle that would really make her feel the weight of her actions. And then there was the banner. I wanted something big, something that would really catch people's attention. I designed a huge banner that announced Emily's affair and the fact that she would soon be my ex-wife. I made sure it was bold and impossible to miss, something that would not only embarrass her but also get the whole neighborhood talking. Every step of the planning was carefully thought out. I wanted to ensure that my actions were impactful and visible. I wasn't just looking to get back at Emily. I wanted everyone to know exactly why this was happening. The day came when I was finally ready to put my plan into action. It was a mix of nerves and adrenaline as I prepared everything. I had to make sure I didn't get caught while I was carrying out these acts. I was determined to follow through no matter what. In the end, I knew it would be a messy public affair, but that's exactly what I wanted. Emily had betrayed me in the worst way possible, and I was ready to show her just how serious I was about the consequences. So, the day finally came when I was ready to put my revenge plan into action. I was both anxious and determined. I knew I had to be careful and quick to avoid getting caught, 
but I was more focused on making sure my message was loud and clear. First up was the car. I had already bought a bunch of plastic wrap and tape. I waited for a time when Emily was out. She was supposed to be visiting her friends, so I used that opportunity. I went to the parking lot and started wrapping her car in layers of plastic wrap. It took a while, but I made sure it was tightly sealed and completely covered. It looked ridiculous, almost like a giant sausage on wheels. I knew it would be impossible for her to drive without taking hours to remove the wrap. Next, I took the banner. I had it made in big, bold letters. Emily's affair with Tom, soon to be my ex-wife. It was hard to miss. I found a place on the front of the house where it could be easily seen by anyone passing by. I used strong adhesive and made sure it was securely attached. It was as eye-catching as I could make it, intended to grab everyone's attention and ensure that the whole neighborhood would see it. After setting up the banner and car, I moved on to the condoms. I knew this part was going to be tricky, but I was committed. I carefully placed the punctured condoms back where Emily kept them, making sure they were exactly where she'd find them. It was a small act, but I wanted to add an extra layer of discomfort to her already troubled situation. The whole process was exhausting. I had to keep an eye out for anyone who might spot me or see what I was doing, but I managed to get everything done without anyone noticing. When I stepped back and looked at the finished work, I felt a mix of satisfaction and nervous anticipation. I knew that Emily would see the car first and be shocked. The banner would follow, making sure that her affair was out in the open for everyone to see. And the condoms would just be the final humiliating touch. I wasn't just getting back at Emily. I was making sure that the entire mess was laid bare for everyone to see. The next part was waiting for Emily's reaction. I could only imagine how she'd react when she saw the car and the banner. I knew it was going to be messy, and I had no idea how she'd handle it, but I was ready for whatever came next. The morning after I'd set everything up, I was a bundle of nerves. I knew Emily would be seeing the car and the banner today. I had to stay away from home to avoid any direct confrontation, so I spent the day out, keeping my phone close in case anything happened. By mid-morning I started getting calls and messages from friends and neighbors. They'd seen the banner and were all asking questions. Some were shocked, some were sympathetic, and some were downright curious. It was clear the scandal had spread fast, and people were talking. I finally got a call from one of my old buddies who lived a few streets away. He said he'd seen the car wrapped up and couldn't believe what he was seeing. He told me that the whole street was buzzing with gossip. People were pointing taking pictures and talking about Emily's affair. The banner was doing its job, everyone knew about it, and there was no way Emily could escape the public humiliation. Around noon, I got a message from Emily. It was a frantic text asking if I'd seen what was happening. She said she was completely freaked out and didn't know how to handle it. I didn't respond right away. I wanted to let her stew in her panic a bit longer. I eventually headed back home in the afternoon. As I pulled up, I saw Emily's reaction firsthand. She was outside, frantically trying to peel off the plastic wrap from her car. It was a total mess. She was red-faced, crying, and shouting at anyone who came near, clearly mortified by the public display. The banner was still up, and Emily had put up a pitiful attempt to cover it with a makeshift sheet. It didn't do much to hide the words, though. She looked completely overwhelmed and desperate. The whole neighborhood was watching, and I could hear the murmurs and comments from the crowd that had gathered. Emily tried to call me several times, but I ignored her calls. I knew she was trying to salvage some dignity, but it was too late. The damage was done. The public humiliation was exactly what I'd hoped for. Emily was facing the full force of her actions being laid out for everyone to see. As I watched her struggling with the car and the banner, I felt a grim satisfaction. It was harsh, but it was a small price for what she'd put me through. I knew things were only going to get more complicated from here, but seeing her in this state gave me a sense of closure and justice for the betrayal. The fallout from the public exposure was immediate and intense. Emily was now dealing with the full force of the scandal. As I watched from a distance, it became clear that the situation was far from just an embarrassment. It was a full-blown disaster for her. First off, her attempt to remove the plastic wrap from her car was futile. The wrap was tightly sealed, 
and no matter how hard she tried, it took her hours just to make a dent in the mess. Neighbors and passers-by continued to gawk, taking photos and sharing the spectacle online. The whole scene was a media frenzy, with local gossip spreading like wildfire. The banner, despite her best efforts to cover it up, was still very much visible. It hung there, a permanent reminder of her affair and the upcoming divorce. People in the neighborhood were talking about it, speculating on the details and adding their own spin to the story. Emily's name was all over town, and it was clear that her reputation was taking a serious hit. Emily tried to maintain her composure, but it was clear she was struggling. She was receiving angry phone calls and messages from friends, family, and even colleagues. Her work life was affected too. She was getting questions and judgments from everyone she knew. The humiliation was spreading beyond just the physical display. It was invading every part of her life. At home, Emily was in a state of panic. She was calling her lawyer, trying to figure out how to deal with the fallout and the potential legal issues. Her frantic attempts to fix the car and deal with the banner were half-hearted. She was overwhelmed, and it showed in her every move. She'd come home late, exhausted and emotionally drained. On top of all this, Emily had to deal with the personal impact of the punctured condoms. Though it was a smaller part of my plan, it added to her stress. She had no idea why they were damaged, but the thought of Tom potentially facing issues because of them only added another layer of anxiety to her already chaotic situation. As the days went by, Emily's humiliation deepened. She tried to avoid going out, but it was impossible. Every time she stepped outside, she faced whispers and stares from neighbors and acquaintances. Her reputation was in tatters, and it was clear that she was feeling the weight of her actions, both publicly and privately. For me, watching Emily go through this was a bitter mix of satisfaction and sadness. I wanted her to understand the gravity of what she'd done, but seeing her so devastated was a stark reminder of how deeply the betrayal had cut. It was a harsh reality check for both of us, and the fallout was far from over. So, after the public spectacle, things between Emily and me were at a breaking point. She was a mess, and her attempts to salvage her reputation only seemed to make things worse. I knew it was time for a final confrontation to wrap things up and close this chapter. Emily came home one evening, looking exhausted and defeated. She had been trying to repair the damage and deal with the backlash, but nothing seemed to help. She was at her breaking point, and I could see it in her face. Her usually calm demeanor was gone, replaced by sheer desperation. She tried to approach me with a plea for understanding. She said she was sorry that she had made a huge mistake and that she wanted to fix things. She tried to explain the affair, saying it was a momentary lapse in judgment and that she wanted to work on our relationship. She promised to make amends and begged for another chance. But by this point, I was resolute. I had seen too much, endured too much pain, and the betrayal was too deep. I couldn't just forget or forgive. I told her straight up that there was no coming back from this. I made it clear that the damage was done and there was no way to repair what had been broken. Emily broke down completely. She was crying, pleading, and trying to convince me that things could be different. But I wasn't swayed. I had seen her deceit and the way she tried to cover it up. The affair had been with someone who was directly connected to the accident that put me in bed, and that added another layer of betrayal. The conversation turned into an emotional outburst from both of us. She blamed me for not trusting her, for being too quick to judge, and for making the whole situation public. I tried to stay calm and collected, but it was hard not to get caught up in the raw emotion of the moment. Ultimately, I stood firm on my decision. I told her that our marriage was over and that there was no going back. I made it clear that I couldn't continue living with the betrayal and the lies. I was done. Emily left the house in tears, and I was left alone to process everything. The confrontation had been intense, but it was necessary. It was the final act of closure for me, and now I needed to focus on moving forward and rebuilding my life. It was a difficult and painful process, but I knew that I had done what I needed to do. The affair had left a scar, but it was time to start healing and find a way to move on from the mess that Emily had created. After the final confrontation, life started to settle into a new, quieter routine. Emily moved out, 
and I was left with the task of picking up the pieces and finding a way to move forward. The first few days were a whirlwind of emotions. I felt a mix of relief and sadness. The relief came from knowing that the constant stress and betrayal were behind me. The sadness was from the end of a significant part of my life. It was a tough adjustment, but I was determined to focus on myself and start healing. I began by addressing practical matters. I had to deal with the fallout from the affair, dividing assets, sorting out financials, and getting my life back in order. It was a lot of work, but it was necessary to establish a new normal. I also took time to reflect on everything that had happened. I tried to understand how I got to this point and what I could learn from it. It was a painful process, but it helped me come to terms with the betrayal and start to let go of the anger. I knew holding on to that anger would only keep me stuck in the past. Gradually, I started rebuilding my life. I reconnected with old friends and made an effort to be social again. I threw myself into hobbies and interests I'd neglected during the turmoil of my marriage. It was a way to rediscover who I was outside of the relationship and to find joy in things that had once brought me happiness. One of the most important things was focusing on my well-being. I began exercising regularly, eating healthier, and taking care of my mental health. It wasn't about forgetting the past, but about moving forward and ensuring I was in a better place for myself. I also made a conscious effort to let go of any lingering bitterness toward Emily. I didn't want to let her actions continue to affect my life. Forgiving her wasn't about reconciliation. It was about freeing myself from the anger and hurt that had dominated my life for so long. Over time, I started to see a future beyond the betrayal. I realized that while the past had been painful, it didn't have to define me. I was ready to move forward, to explore new opportunities, and to build a life that was truly my own. In the end, the journey wasn't easy, but it was necessary. The experience taught me a lot about resilience and the importance of self-care. I learned that even after the worst of betrayals, it's possible to find peace and start anew. It was a tough road, but I was finally ready to embrace it and look forward to what lay ahead.